Question 2, Part 2 of Summa Theologica Secunda Secunde, Treatise on the Theological Virtues, The Virtue of Faith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Summa Theologica Secunda Secunde, Treatise on the Theological Virtues, The Virtue of Faith by St. Thomas Aquinas, translated by the Fathers of the English Dominican Province. Question 2 of the Act of Faith in Ten Articles Part 2, Articles 6 through 10 Sixth Article Whether all are equally bound to have explicit faith? Objection 1 it would seem that all are equally bound to have explicit faith. For all are bound to those things which are necessary for salvation, as is evidenced by the precepts of charity. Now it is necessary for salvation that certain things should be believed explicitly. Therefore, all are equally bound to have explicit faith. Objection 2. Further, no one should be put to the test in matters that he is not bound to believe. But simple persons are sometimes tested in reference to the slightest articles of faith. Therefore, all are bound to believe everything explicitly. Objection 3. Further, if the simple are bound to have, not explicit but only implicit faith, their faith must needs be implied in the faith of the learned. But this seems unsafe, since it is possible for the learned to err. Therefore, it seems that the simple should also have explicit faith, so that all are, therefore, equally bound to have explicit faith. On the contrary, it is written in Job 1.14, the oxen were ploughing, and the asses feeding beside them. Because, as Gregory expounds in this passage, in his commentary on Job 2.17, the simple, who are signified by the asses, ought in matters of faith to stay by the learned, who are denoted by the oxen. I answer that, the unfolding of matters of faith is the result of divine revelation. For matters of faith surpass natural reason. Now divine revelation reaches those of lower degree through those who are over them in a certain order. To men, for instance, through the angels, and to the lower angels through the higher, as Dionysius explains in On the Heavenly Hierarchy 4.7. In like manner, therefore, the unfolding of faith must needs reach men of lower degree through those of higher degree. Consequently, just as the higher angels, who enlighten those who are below them, have a fuller knowledge of divine things than the lower angels, as Dionysius states, on the heavenly hierarchy 12, so too men of higher degree, whose business it is to teach others, are under obligation to have fuller knowledge of matters of faith, and to believe them more explicitly. Reply to Objection 1 The unfolding of the articles of faith is not equally necessary for the salvation of all, since those of higher degree, whose duty it is to teach others, are bound to believe explicitly more things than others are. Reply to Objection 2. Simple persons should not be put to the test about subtle questions of faith, unless they be suspected of having been corrupted by heretics, who are wont to corrupt the faith of simple people in such questions. If, however, it is found that they are free from obstinacy in their heterodox sentiments, and that it is due to their simplicity, it is no fault of theirs. Reply to Objection 3. The simple have no faith implied in that of the learned, 
except in so far as the latter adhere to the divine teaching. Hence the Apostle says, in 1 Corinthians 4.16, Be ye followers of me, as I also am of Christ. Hence it is not human knowledge, but the divine truth that is the rule of faith. And if any of the learned stray from this rule, he does not harm the faith of the simple ones, who think that the learned believe aright, unless the simple hold obstinately to their individual errors against the faith of the universal church, which cannot err, since our Lord said, Luke 22.32, I have prayed for thee, Peter, that thy faith fail not. 7th Article Whether it is necessary for the salvation of all that they should believe explicitly in the mystery of Christ. Objection 1. It would seem that it is not necessary for the salvation of all that they should believe explicitly in the mystery of Christ. For man is not bound to believe explicitly what the angels are ignorant about since the unfolding of faith is the result of divine revelation, which reaches man by means of the angels as stated above, Article 6, as well as Pars Prima, Question 111, Article 1. Now even the angels were in ignorance of the mystery of the Incarnation. Hence, according to the commentary of Dionysius, on the heavenly hierarchy 7, it is they who ask, in Psalm 23, 8, Who is this King of glory? As well as in Isaiah 63, 1, Who is this that cometh from Edom? Therefore, men were not bound to believe explicitly in the mystery of Christ's incarnation. Objection 2. Further, it is evident that John the Baptist was one of the teachers, and most nigh to Christ, who said of him, in Matthew 11.11, 11, that There hath not risen among them that are born of women greater than he. Now John the Baptist does not appear to have known the mystery of Christ explicitly, since he asked Christ, Matthew 11.3, Art thou he that art to come, or look we for another? Therefore, even the teachers were not bound to explicit faith in Christ. Objection 3. Further, many Gentiles obtained salvation through the ministry of the angels, as Dionysius states, on the heavenly hierarchy 9. Now it would seem that the Gentiles had neither explicit nor implicit faith in Christ, since they received no revelation. Therefore, it seems that it was not necessary for the salvation of all to believe explicitly in the mystery of Christ. On the contrary, Augustine says in his On Rebuke and Grace 7, as well as in his letter 190, Our faith is sound if we believe that no man, old or young, is delivered from the contagion of death and the bonds of sin, except by the one mediator of God and men, Jesus Christ. I answer that, as stated above in Article 5, as well as in Question 1, Article 8, the object of faith includes, properly and directly, that thing through which man obtains beatitude. Now the mystery of Christ's incarnation and passion is the way by which men obtain beatitude, for it is written, in Acts 4.12, There is no other name under heaven given to men, whereby we must be saved. Therefore, belief of some kind in the mystery of Christ's incarnation was necessary at all times and for all persons. But this belief differed according to differences of times and persons. The reason of this is that, before the state of sin, man believed, explicitly in Christ's incarnation, in so far as it was intended for the consummation of glory. 
but not as it was intended to deliver man from sin by the passion and resurrection since man had no foreknowledge of his future sin he does however seem to have had foreknowledge of the incarnation of christ from the fact that he said in genesis two twenty four wherefore a man shall leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife of which the apostle says in ephesians five thirty two that this is a great sacrament in christ and the church and it is incredible that the first man was ignorant about this sacrament but after sin man believed explicitly in christ not only as to the incarnation but also as to the passion and resurrection whereby the human race is delivered from sin and death for they would not else have foreshadowed christ's passion by certain sacrifices both before and after the law the meaning of which sacrifices was known by the learned explicitly while the simple folk under the veil of those sacrifices believe them to be ordained by god in reference to christ's coming and thus their knowledge was covered with a veil so to speak and as stated above in question one article seven the nearer they were to christ the more distinct was their knowledge of christ's mysteries after grace had been revealed both learned and simple folk are bound to explicit faith in the mysteries of christ chiefly as regards those which are observed throughout the church and publicly proclaimed such as the articles which refer to the incarnation of which we have spoken above question one article eight as to other minute points in reference to the articles of the incarnation men have been bound to believe them more or less explicitly according to each one's state and office reply to objection one the mystery of the kingdom of god was not entirely hidden from the angels as augustine observes in on the literal meaning of genesis five nineteen yet certain aspects thereof were better known to them when christ revealed them to them reply to objection two it was not through ignorance that john the baptist inquired of christ's advent in the flesh since he had clearly professed his belief therein saying i saw and i gave testimony that this is the son of god john one thirty four hence he did not say art thou he that hast come but art thou that art to come thus saying about the future not about the past likewise it is not to be believed that he was ignorant of christ's future passion for he had already said in john one thirty nine behold the lamb of god behold him who taketh away the sins of the world thus foretelling his future immolation and since other prophets had foretold it as may be seen especially in isaiah fifty three we may therefore say with gregory in his homily twenty six on the gospel that he asked this question being in ignorance as to whether christ would descend into hell in his own person but he did not ignore the fact that the power of christ's passion would be extended to those who were detained in limbo according to zechariah nine eleven thou also by the blood of thy testament hast sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein there is no water nor was he bound to believe explicitly before its fulfilment that christ was to descend thither himself it may also be replied that as ambrose observes in his commentary on luke seven nineteen he made this inquiry not from doubt or ignorance but from devotion or again with chrysostom in his homily twenty six on matthew that he inquired not as though ignorant himself but because he wished his disciples to be satisfied on that point through christ hence the latter framed his answer so as to instruct the disciples 
by pointing to the signs of his work. Reply to Objection 3 Many of the Gentiles received revelations of Christ, as is clear from their predictions. Thus we read in Job 19.25, I know that my Redeemer liveth. The Sibyl too foretold certain things about Christ, as Augustine states, in Against the Manichaean Faustus 13.15. Moreover, we read in the history of the Romans that at the time of Constantine Augustus and his mother Irene, a tomb was discovered, wherein lay a man on whose breast was a golden plate with the inscription, Christ shall be born of a virgin, and in him I believe. O son, during the lifetime of Irene and Constantine, thou shalt see me again. If, however, some were saved without receiving any revelation, they were not saved without faith in a mediator, for though they did not believe in him explicitly, they did nevertheless have implicit faith through believing in divine providence. Since they believed that God would deliver mankind in whatever way was pleasing to him, and according to the revelation of the Spirit to those who knew the truth, as stated in Job 35.11, Who teacheth us more than the beasts of the earth, Eighth article. Whether it is necessary for salvation to believe explicitly in the Trinity. Objection 1. It would seem that it was not necessary for salvation to believe explicitly in the Trinity. For the Apostle says in Hebrews 11.6, He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and is a rewarder to them that seek him. Now one can believe this, without believing in the Trinity. Therefore, it was not necessary to believe explicitly in the Trinity. Objection 2. Further, our Lord said in John seventeen five and 6, Father, I have manifested thy name to men, which words Augustine expounds in his Tractatus 106 as follows, not the name by which thou art called God, but the name whereby thou art called my Father. And further on he adds, In that he made this world, God is known to all nations, in that he is not to be worshipped together with false gods, God is known in Judea, but in that he is Father of this Christ, through whom he takes away the sin of the world, he now makes known to men this name of his, which hitherto they knew not. Therefore, before the coming of Christ it was not known that paternity and filiation were in the Godhead, and so the Trinity was not believed explicitly. Objection 3. Further, that which we are bound to believe explicitly of God is the object of heavenly happiness. Now the object of heavenly happiness is the sovereign good, which can be understood to be in God, without any distinction of persons. Therefore, it was not necessary to believe explicitly in the Trinity. On the contrary, in the Old Testament, the Trinity of persons is expressed in many ways. Thus, at the very outset of Genesis, it is written in manifestation of the Trinity, Let us make man to our image and likeness. Genesis 1.26 Therefore, from the very beginning, it was necessary for salvation to believe in the Trinity. I answer that, It is impossible to believe explicitly in the mystery of Christ without faith in the Trinity, since the mystery of Christ includes that the Son of God took flesh, that he renewed the world through the grace of the Holy Ghost, and again, that he was conceived by the Holy Ghost. Wherefore, just as before Christ, the mystery of Christ was believed explicitly by the learned, but implicitly and under a veil, so to speak, by the simple, so too was it with the mystery of the Trinity, 
and consequently, when once grace had been revealed, all were bound to explicit faith in the mystery of the Trinity, and all who are born again in Christ have this bestowed on them by the invocation of the Trinity, according to Matthew 28.19. Going, therefore, teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Reply to Objection 1. Explicit faith in those two things was necessary at all times and for all people, but it was not sufficient at all times and for all people. Reply to Objection 2. Before Christ's coming, faith in the Trinity lay hidden in the faith of the learned, but through Christ and the apostles it was shown to the world. Reply to Objection 3. God's sovereign goodness, as we understand it now through its effects, can be understood without the Trinity of Persons, but as understood in itself, and as seen by the blessed, it cannot be understood without the trinity of persons. Moreover, the mission of the divine persons brings us to heavenly happiness. Ninth Article Whether to Believe is Meritorious Objection 1. It would seem that to believe is not meritorious. For the principle of all merit is charity, as stated above, in Bars Prima Secunde, question 114, article 4. Now faith, like nature, is a preamble to charity. Therefore, just as an act of nature is not meritorious, since we do not merit by our natural gifts, so neither is an act of faith. Objection 2. Further, belief is a mean between opinion and scientific knowledge or the consideration of things scientifically known. Translator's note, science is a certain knowledge of a demonstrated conclusion through its demonstration. Now the considerations of science are not meritorious, nor, on the other hand, is opinion. Therefore, belief is not meritorious. Objection 3. Further, he who assents to a point of faith either has a sufficient motive for believing, or he has not. If he has a sufficient motive for his belief, this does not seem to imply any merit on his part, since he is no longer free to believe or not to believe. Whereas, if he has not a sufficient motive for believing, this is a mark of levity, according to Ecclesiasticus 19.4. He that is hasty to give credit is light of heart, so that, seemingly, he gains no merit thereby. Therefore, to believe is by no means meritorious. On the contrary, it is written in Hebrews 11.33 that the saints by faith obtain promises, which would not be the case if they did not merit by believing. Therefore, to believe is meritorious. I answer that, as stated above in Pars Prima Secunde, question 114, articles 3 and 4, our actions are meritorious insofar as they proceed from the free will moved with grace by God. Therefore, every human act proceeding from the free will, if it be referred to God, can be meritorious. Now the act of believing is an act of the intellect assenting to the divine truth at the command of the will moved by the grace of God, so that it is subject to the free will in relation to God, and consequently the act of faith can be meritorious. Reply to Objection 1. Nature is compared to charity which is the principle of merit, as matter to form, whereas faith is compared to charity as the disposition which precedes the ultimate form. Now it is evident that the subject, or the matter, cannot act save by virtue of the form, 
nor can a preceding disposition before the advent of the form but after the advent of the form both the subject and the preceding disposition act by virtue of the form which is the chief principle of action even as the heat of fire acts by virtue of the substantial form of fire accordingly neither nature nor faith can without charity produce a meritorious act but when accompanied by charity the act of faith is made meritorious thereby even as an act of nature and a natural act of the free will reply to objection two two things may be considered in science namely the scientist's assent to a scientific fact and his consideration of that fact now the assent of science is not subject to free will because the scientist is obliged to assent by force of the demonstration wherefore scientific assent is not meritorious but the actual consideration of what a man knows scientifically is subject to his free will for it is in his power to consider or not to consider hence scientific consideration may be meritorious if it be referred to the end of charity that is to the honor of god or the good of our neighbor on the other hand in the case of faith both these things are subject to the free will so that in both respects the act of faith can be meritorious whereas in the case of opinion there is no firm assent since it is weak and infirm as the philosopher observes in his posterior analytics 133 so that it does not seem to proceed from a perfect act of the will and for this reason as regards the assent it does not appear to be very meritorious although it can be as regards the actual consideration reply to objection three the believer has sufficient motive for believing for he is moved by the authority of divine teaching confirmed by miracles and what is more by the inward instinct of the divine invitation hence he does not believe lightly he has not however sufficient reason for scientific knowledge hence he does not lose the merit tenth article whether reasons in support of what we believe lessen the merit of faith objection one it would seem that reasons in support of what we believe lessen the merit of faith for gregory says in his homily 26 on the gospel that there is no merit in believing what is shown by reason if therefore human reason provides sufficient proof the merit of faith is altogether taken away therefore it seems that any kind of human reasoning in support of matters of faith diminishes the merit of believing objection to further whatever lessens the measure of virtue lessens the amount of merit since happiness is the reward of virtue as the philosopher states in ethics one nine now human reasoning seems to diminish the measure of the virtue of faith since it is essential to faith to be about the unseen as stated above question one articles four and five now the more a thing is supported by reasons the less it is unseen therefore human reasons in support of matters of faith diminish the merit of faith objection three further contrary things have contrary causes now an inducement in opposition to faith increases the merit of faith whether it consist in persecution inflicted by one who endeavors to force a man to renounce his faith or in an argument persuading him to do so therefore reasons in support of faith diminish the merit of faith on the contrary it is written in first peter three fifteen being ready always to satisfy every one that asketh you a reason of that faith and hope which is in you translator's note the vulgate reads of that hope which is in you 
St. Thomas's reading is apparently taken from Bede. Now the Apostle would not give this advice if it would imply a diminution in the merit of faith. Therefore, reason does not diminish the merit of faith. I answer that, as stated above in Article 9, the act of faith can be meritorious in so far as it is subject to the will, not only as to the use, but also as to the assent. Now human reason, in support of what we believe, may stand in a twofold relation to the will of the believer. First, as preceding the act of the will, as for instance, when a man either has not the will, nor a prompt will, to believe, unless he be moved by human reasons, and in this way human reason diminishes the merit of faith. In this sense, it has been said above, in Pars Prima Secundae, question 24, article 3, first reply, as well as question 77, article 6, second reply, that in moral virtues, a passion which precedes choice makes the virtuous act less praiseworthy. For just as a man ought to perform acts of moral virtue on account of the judgment of his reason and not on account of a passion, so ought he to believe matters of faith not on account of human reason but on account of the divine authority. Secondly, human reasons may be consequent to the will of the believer. For when a man's will is ready to believe, he loves the truth he believes. He thinks out and takes to heart whatever reasons he can find in support thereof. And in this way, human reason does not exclude the merit of faith, but is a sign of greater merit. Thus again, in moral virtues, a consequent passion is the sign of a more prompt will, as stated above, in Pars Prima Secundae, Question 24, Article 3, First Reply. We have an indication of this in the words of the Samaritans to the woman, who is a type of human reason. We now believe, not for thy saying. John 4.42 4, Reply to Objection 1 Gregory is referring to the case of a man who has no will to believe what is of faith, unless he be induced by reasons. But when a man has the will to believe what is of faith on the authority of God alone, although he may have reasons in demonstration of some of them, for example, of the existence of God, the merit of his faith is not, for that reason, lost or diminished. Reply to Objection 2 The reasons which are brought forward in support of the authority of faith are not demonstrations which can bring intellectual vision to the human intellect, wherefore they do not cease to be unseen. But they remove obstacles to faith, by showing that what faith proposes is not impossible. Wherefore, such reasons do not diminish the merit or the measure of faith. On the other hand, though demonstrative reasons in support of the preambles of faith but not the articles of faith, diminish the measure of faith, since they make the thing believed to be seen, yet they do not diminish the measure of charity, which makes the will ready to believe them, even if they were unseen, and so the measure of merit is not diminished. Reply to Objection 3. Whatever is in opposition to faith, whether it consist in a man's thoughts, or an outward persecution, increases the merit of faith, in so far as the will is shown to be more prompt and firm in believing. Hence the martyrs had more merit of faith through not renouncing the faith on account of persecution. And even the wise have greater merit of faith through not renouncing their faith on account of the reasons brought forward by philosophers or heretics in opposition to faith. On the other hand, Things that are favorable to faith do not always diminish the promptness of the will to believe, and therefore they do not always diminish the merit of faith. End of question 2
Read by Michael Shane Craig Lambert, L.C.